And there's a lot of people out here fighting for you, Leonard. I want you to know that all over. I mean, uh, all over. Uh, you know, I said I love them all. Thank you. I love them. You know, it's been a long struggle, and I did my best to uh, keep the Indian struggle alive and do what I could. You know, I'll, I'll say this, Leonard. It's not a matter of if we get you out. It's a matter of when. And so you just all keep right. you just keep ha- you, you just keep hanging on. We're 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 it's we're all in. We're all in getting you out. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you That's what I want to hear. Yeah, the whole the whole world yeah, the whole yeah. world's waiting for you to get out, Leonard. Yeah, I know. I'm hearing. I'm hearing it. I don't see it or really feel it, but, but I'm hearing it, and uh, uh, it's making me uh, happy. I know that it. He hit the 15 minute mark. Nick Tilson, uh, this is Nick Tilson, and we are on the land back for the People Show. Uh, coming coming straight out of the Osheti Shakoi here in Mini Luzaha, in uh, the Chesapa, the Black Hills, and Rapid City, South Dakota, in our studio uh, here for Land Back for the People. This podcast is dedicated to continue to uplift. The stories of indigenous liberation, indigenous resistance, and all the work that indigenous people are doing to do the work of defending, developing, and decolonizing in their communities. In this episode, we are going to talk about the over-incarceration of indigenous people, but more specifically, we are going to talk about political prisoners and our efforts to fight for Leonard Paltier. As some of you may may or may not know, Leonard Paltier of the American Indian Movement has been incarcerated for 48 years um, for a crime that he did not commit, the killing of two um, Federal Bureau of Investigation police officers uh, in uh, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in the 1970s. And We will talk about the history of the movement, of the American Indian movement, but but, but along with the counterintelligence strategies of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to silence the movement. A lot of people don't realize in that time, in that history, after the Wounded Knee occupation in 1973, there was a reign of terror on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, in which many people were murdered and killed. And it was in the climate of that time in which the Federal Bureau of Investigation was doing counterintelligence against the American Indian movement because they wanted to destroy the American Indian movement because it was creating an uprising of change throughout Indian country. It was creating an uprising of indigenous people fighting for their land, fighting for their human rights, fighting for, uh, you know, sustainable economies, fighting for their culture and their languages. And the American Indian movement, you know, started in 1968. And from 1968 uh, to 1976, there was a massive wave of change. And the American Indian movement were willing to speak truth to power. They were willing to occupy places like Alcatraz Island. They were willing to occupy places um, like the BIA headquarters in Washington, D.C., like Mount Rushmore in 1971, um, and like Wounded Knee in 1973, because they understood that the erasure of indigenous people was persistent and it was constant. And so direct action and occupation were needed in order to raise awareness uh, of what was happening to Indian people. And the American Indian movement was becoming very successful at raising awareness, pushing back against false narratives. And so in the 1970s, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation decided 
that it's battleground to try to silence the American Indian movement was the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, my home community, um, the land of the Oglala people. And so during that period of time, in that climate, is when the shootout happened in Oglala, South Dakota. And as a result of that, Leonard Paltier has been incarcerated for 48 years, being the longest living indigenous political prisoner in American history. And he is still incarcerated to this day. In this show, we will dive deep into understanding why he's incarcerated and bring to light many of the opportunities that exist to work towards his freedom and his liberation. Uh, we're going to be talking today about Leonard Paltier uh, and, and the efforts for his freedom and for his liberation. Um, and we have two people who have been working on this issue. Uh, Bruce Ellison has been working on this issue uh, way back farther than uh, you probably wish to for me to say. Uh, you know, don't want to date him, but I'm, okay. but 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 my understanding was that Bruce arrived in Rapid City, South Dakota, maybe the day or close to the day of the shootout at Oglala. Um, and Holly Cook Macaro has been working hard um, here at Indian Collective and with partners throughout the country uh, on the current campaign uh, over the past few years to free Leonard Paltier. So we're going to be able to have some both historical perspective and some current uh, some current perspective um, and also how you all can join uh, the movement to free Leonard Paltier. Uh, but we're going to start off with introductions. We're going to start off uh, with Holly to uh, introduce yourself and tell a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Nick. Um, Anin Buju. My name is Holly Cook Macaro. I am from the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe in Northern Minnesota, and um, I have been doing work in Washington D.C. Going on, gosh, twenty-seven years, I think. Now I now I've got your problem, Bruce. <laughs> Aging myself here. Um, and I started in the in the Clinton White House. Uh, doing Indian Affairs um, for President Clinton in 1997 and 1998. And then I moved over to the Democratic National Committee, where I served as the director of the Office of Native American Affairs um, and served there during that historic Gore, Gore v. Bush election, um, where I ended it in Florida in the, as an observer in Dixie County when the Supreme Court decided that election on December 9th of 2000. Of 2000. And... Um, from there, I I uh, moved into the private sector and began work as an advocate in government affairs for tribes uh, and took several breaks from that to work on campaigns here in South Dakota and Tim Johnson in 2002. I was the native vote director in New Mexico I in 2004. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that was a close one. And um, and uh, and then turned to um, raising money. Um, for candidates in Indian country and um, um, have, have put together a good bundle for for Hillary in particular. Um, you know, once you're in an, in an administration, your loyalty ties are, are pretty much for life if they end up running for president. So I worked for Hillary on her campaigns, um, have served in an advisory or strategic outreach advisory capacity for every Democratic presidential um, candidate over the last 20, 20 years. So uh, I continued to do political uh, advisory work and consulting um, and advocacy work and uh, have been here at Indian Collective for the past, uh, going on two years now. So it um, that's that's uh, where we land today. You Thank can you. All, you can all see why we helped uh, recruit uh, Holly to our team. Uh, when I was reaching out to uh, people in the community, board members and people that Indian Collective was networked with, uh, I was like, I need somebody to help us in D.C. because I don't know how that all works and how we organize to uh, have influence and influence decision making. And your name kept coming up from several <laughs> people. So here we are two years later working on uh, working on this campaign. So welcome to the show um, and, and and welcome you know to, to the team over the past two years. Miigwech, Nick. Um, 
Bruce, would you mind introducing yourself um, to the audience here on the Land Back for the People show? Um, that's something I always like to do, but I'm happy to do that. Um, aside from my name, yeah. My name is Bruce Ellison. I'm an attorney. I'm a criminal defense attorney um, and a water rights attorney. Um, and uh, I got involved in, I came out here to South Dakota in 1975. And as Holly mentioned, like four days after, or you mentioned it, four days after the firefight, um, for about a week, I'd already made a commitment to join a uh, legal defense offense uh, organization, which existed here, the Wounded Knee Defense Committee, which was providing legal representation to people who were being charged with crimes around their uh, resistance at Wounded Knee, as well as uh, some civil lawsuits designed to try and protect people's constitutional rights, which were being pretty flagrantly violated. But I came out here as a criminal defense attorney. Came out a week after the firefight for a week, uh, stopped studying for the bar exam in New York and in South Dakota um, to see if I could help, and I was told yes. And so I came out and did whatever people asked me to do. Uh, I came back in September, and it was an interesting time, and I'll, I'll try and be brief, but it was a it was all learning experiences for me. I mean, I grew up in and around New York City, um, and the first indigenous person that I know that I met was at law school. There was a man in my class um, who all he talked about was that he wanted to work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and um, I missed most of my first couple of years of law school from an accident, but... He wasn't there when I got back, so I don't know whatever happened to him. Um, but my interest in criminal law and my working at the at the end of my third year in law school with the International Treaty Council, it was at that time trying to get NGO and got NGO status. Uh, it became the second organization after the Palestine Liberation Organization to get that status at the UN. And hmm. I helped find offices and move furniture and do things like that. And the folks I was working with, suggested I consider coming out to the Wounded Defense Committee as a staff attorney. And after thinking about uh, everything that I thought that it meant and having no idea of what it really meant, um, I came out to offer my total lack of experience, my law school training, but as I could as a, as a lawyer. And I got involved in that way representing Leonard Peltier. Um, Leonard was extradited in December of 1970. Six and um, I was for just from circumstance the first American lawyer that he saw uh, in the United States. We kind of met each other at the Pennant County Jail here in in Rapid City, um, and that just began a began a long path. Uh, he was already part of the case that I was working on, the Butler Robidoux case. Daryl Butler and Bob Robidoux, along with Leonard Peltier and Jimmy Eagle, were indicted for killing the FBI agents. Yeah, can you, can you, can, you, can we, um appreciate the introduction? I want us to, to go back a little bit. To, okay, sure. To understand, like, uh, what happened at the Jumping Bull compound that day, um, and also what was a little bit of like you, know, you were you were around at that time, like what was sort of happening? What was the climate like um, going into what happened on that day, and and just give us a little bit of background on that day and sort of uh, for folks that are. Uh, of the younger generation listening um, and folks who may or may not know about the history of this case. Wounded Knee happened uh, in 1973. Uh, it was a, basically a, a, uh, a protest against the corrupt tribal government that was going to go to Pine Ridge and, and raise protests at government buildings, but because of the, the U.S. government having brought in paramilitary forces and set up heavy weaponry, on the buildings in Pine Ridge, people decided to avoid a confrontation and went on to Wounded Knee. And it was just going to be a protest there, but people quickly found themselves surrounded and a siege developed that lasted for 73 days um, and aroused the attention of not only people all over here, uh, but all over the world. It became uh, a symbol of, of so many aspects of, of resistance. Um, when, when after 71 days, uh, there was a negotiated end to the, the siege, the government promised to hold hearings on treaty rights and to look into justice issues. Um, 
the situation out here was, uh, at the time, was one of, and remains, uh, of incredible racism. And there were uh, basically people who were considered people and people who were not considered people. And the people in the indigenous community were not considered people and their lives were not considered the same as the non-Indian uh, community in this area. And on the Pine Ridge Reservation, there had been a corrupt administration that had been uh, managed to get itself elected through a, a, uh, an election, the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, highly questioned in terms of its uh, propriety and, and validity. Um, and the tribal chairman had, uh, as many despots have really around the world, uh, had basically organized an armed group of people to basically eliminate his opponents. And uh, as in so many places in the world, uh, they had the backing of the United States government. And the United States government, uh, uh, according to some of their own people, provide weapons, uh, ammunition, uh, intelligence information, uh, explosives. Uh, pretty well-funded situation. Pretty well-funded situation. If you wanted a job, you had to work for the Dick Wilson administration. If you and that you could be a tribal ranger, for example, there were a good number of members of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police, which at the time were the local police force, which were members of the Goon Squad. There were also people who, on the, the tribal police force, BIA police force, that had quite opposite views as well. Um, but there were a lot of goons, and they called themselves goons, the guardians of the Ogala Nation. But that basically they knew, like many paramilitary forces since then they could operate with basic impunity. And what they did was they literally, you know, the Pine Ridge at that time was essentially the the, the pro-tribal government people were mainly centered in the, around the community of Pine Ridge. But there were like seven districts, nine districts, I can't remember, in, in Pine Ridge. and um, Eight districts. Eight districts, thank the, you. The ninth one became Pine Ridge. All right. Yeah. The, and the other ones, the outlying districts, were much more traditionally oriented. I mean, one of the fascinating things to me as a 25-year-old coming out from a rural, uh, from a suburban, uh, urban environment um, was to meet elders who didn't speak any English or very little English, to, to see a whole different kind of family and, and really societal structure that uh, revered elders and uh, that was just this sharing and there was this, it was a totally different thing. And it became very obvious to me why the government was threatened yeah. by, by people who were speaking up for treaty rights, which had been flagrantly violated for some of the worst living conditions in the country, if not the world, housing, uh, uh, education, uh, medical. But the goon squad actually created by going around into the traditional communities and what they would literally do a lot of times intoxicated the communities were often in circular housing, a cluster housing as it was called. And they would drive around these circles and they would pepper the homes of people's, just shoot through the walls with automatic and semi-automatic weapons fire. And there were scores of people uh, after Wounded Knee and leading up to the day of this firefight uh, about two years later that were killed or maimed, uh, traumatized uh, forever. Uh, I know young people today, well, they're not young today, but who were injured or shot or that during that time. And it so dramatically changed them and interfered with their ability to be what they, what they could have been. And this period of time was, is referred to as the reign of terror. Yes. And it is in this, this atmosphere of the reign of terror that the shootout happened in Oglala, uh, where these, FBI agents, you know, rolled in high speed to a camp of grassroots people and a firefight took place. And the result ended up being that three people were killed. Um, you know, two uh, FBI agents, uh, Kohler and Williams, uh, along with Joe Stunts. A lot of people uh, in the history seem to forget that uh, the the one Native American person that was murdered that day never had any investigation really done into their murder at all. And Joe Stunts, uh, you know, was killed that day, a wounded knee. And um, it launched, you know, I think one of the biggest uh, manhunts in the history of the Federal Bureau of Investigation 
to try to find the killers. Um, but I think it was also part of a, a strategy uh, to try to take down the American Indian movement. It was part of a bigger counterintelligence strategy that was happening at the time. Uh, isn't that right? Yes, if I may add to that, and I'll try and be as brief as I can. The problem with asking a lawyer to talk is getting them to stop. But the the um, what was really clear is what was coming together on that day was not only two years of terrorism of the people on Pine Ridge, but also there had been an AIM convention a couple of months before in uh, in Arizona. And the elders of Pine Ridge asked for the American Indian Movement to come in and help because they would no source of pro literal physical protection from the goon squad. And so a group of folks from the Northwest, which included Lander Peltier and other folks, uh, came to Pine Ridge They and they were welcomed and stayed at the ranch of uh, Harry and Cecilia Jumping Bull. What also was coming on that day was it's clear from FBI documents that came out after Peltier's trial, after the trial of Bob Rabideau and Leonard Peltier, uh, of, uh, and Daryl Butler, was that the FBI, which was trying to clearly engage in a number of different kinds of domestic security operations against the American Indian movement, um, were talking about kind of switching to counterinsurgency. And three weeks before the firefight, senior FBI officials toured the reservation and they were shown an area on the Jumping Bull Ranch, which they were told contained bunkers. And they were told that when it became necessary to assault this place, it, it was those bunkers were going to be a factor. Um, we know that there was a BIA SWAT team, which the FBI had put together, a 10-man SWAT team that had been based in Rosebud that was undergoing maneuvers uh, just happened to be somewhere near the jumping bulls, although they claimed they only had blank ammunition. Um, th a month before the firefight, the FBI began bringing in personnel from agents from other parts of the country. Many of these agents, most of these agents they brought in were SWAT team members. Most of the agents that were stationed in Rapid City were SWAT team members. So it was escalating. It was so like it was escalating. It was an escalating situation. Escalating. And what they did was they took a, a brawl that was between six men who'd known each other, th four native and and two whites, who were drinking and they got into a fight and guys' pair of cowboy boots got taken off and and a uh, shirt got taken off and that was basically it. But one of the four native people was a paid FBI informant at the time. And what the government did was they took this minor incident and turned it into an excuse to saturate the reservation with agents looking for people. And they were looking for people who they were told were involved in this, in this brawl. But at the same time, the FBI had been trying to track Leonard down for, for months. And they were using what they called their security agents and their key index agents to try and locate where he was. And they, they had located him down on Pine Ridge. And the day before the firefight, they literally kidnapped three teenagers who were walking on the road near the jumping bulls. And they took them to Pine Ridge and interrogated them about the camp at the jumping bulls. Mm -hmm. And um, the next day was when they, they came in, although the SWAT team had real ammunition. Not, not blank ammunition. People there told me that within five or 10 minutes, they were feeling completely surrounded and they were taking fire in from all directions. And one of the things that was really clear was that the fire that was coming in was shooting at anything that moved. Mm. And that was how that day began. And one thing I just, and I'll try and do this in a sentence. Um, the discussion of three men dying that day versus two the FBI has only talked about two men dying that day. Leonard and the people with him and the people that I then worked with in honor of many, being an honor to do so, privileged to do so for many decades after that, always considered it to be a day that three people died. And I always, or I long thought as soon as I heard that, that really kind of says it all about the so-called sides that were involved here. And the fact that there were human beings involved in this process and that firefight should never have happened. Those agents were lied to about what they were facing. They were terrified. They were, they were told they were looking for people who had, were involved in a kidnapping and an armed robbery, neither of which were true. They were talked about people who would try and 
use weapons to not be arrested, which was also not true. But it creates a mindset that was part of all of the factors that came together for that explosion. Back here, uh, land back for the people. We're talking about Leonard Paltier, um, and uh, the movement and the struggle to for for Leonard Paltier's freedom. Um, so, Holly, you've been uh, at the work that you've been doing a long time. Complicated stuff, supporting presidential candidates, supporting native candidates, uh, supporting. All kinds of stuff, and it takes tons of research to pull all of that off. Tell me a little bit about, like, how you first started learning more about Leonard Paltier's case and when you started sort of digging into that stuff and learning and reading about the injustice uh, of his case. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed hearing this this history from Bruce, and I think back to um, the way I grew up, and which was in northern Minnesota, and um, which is home to several of the the leadership of AIM. You know, the Bell Courts. Um, you know, the Means were around Dennis Banks uh, from Leech Lake. My grandpa is from from Leech Lake, and uh, I'm I'm from Red Lake. The um, I, what I didn't grow up with, and I, I think um, partly because this was our backyard, was the romanticization, the hero worship of the leadership of AIM and the movement. I think there was um, um, just a little bit of an arm's length. An arm's length. By the time I was, you know, um, a teenager and started thinking about these things, and went on, I kind of went with the narrative that I would probably say um, the FBI pushed all those years, right? Like. You know, Leonard probably did it. There's this, you know, there's some question about uh, questions out there about what happened. But I, um, when you first brought me to this work, Nick, in um, through Indian Collective's long support of um, advocacy for Leonard, um, and I took some time to research and learn about the case, and I can say with all honesty that it has changed the way I do my work. And um, I really feel, I, you know, I'd, I'd spent 25 years um, staying between the lines, um, you know, advocating for appropriations for gaming, all, all important work. This really became about justice for me in learning about this. And I learned about the um, misconduct that took place. You know, growing up in northern Minnesota and in Bemidji, which is, you know, as racist a town as you're going to find as well, in, surrounded by three very large reservations, Red Lake, White Earth, and uh, Leech Lake. The the racism of Indian that uh, of, in Indian communities back at that time period, um, you know, when I was growing up, very familiar with what you reference with what is still in place, and we see very much here, and also with the urban Indian community in Minneapolis. Um, but what I came to learn in doing this research was so much about about Leonard's case, and I've always. I, uh, because I have a family history um, with with my uncle Lee Cook being president of NCI, being one of um, the first Indians to work at the BIA, I've always been fascinated uh, by the politics of that era and with the politics of 1970, of the 70s um, for Indian country, because there were so many changes because of the legislation that came about. What I didn't realize at the time was how much the American Indian movement brought us to the table, how, how much their voice and activism um, just fought back the complacency of what I think um, Indian country needed, or maybe not Indian country, actually what America needed in order to pay attention to what was happening to Indians in America. And what I've learned and what has really shifted the way I do my work um, is this is a bigger picture and we can fight for justice in a way that um, 
makes us think bigger, that makes us tell a story, and that the symbolism of Leonard's long incarceration is, um, and, and you make you've made a good point to me before about this is still about a person that Leonard is that Leonard Peltier is still a human being in there, but he has he has also been a symbol for three generations of activists in Indian Country for why we should continue the fight today. Appreciate appreciate you saying that, Holly, because I think that sometimes we get so focused on we get so focused on that this is a symbol of injustice. It's a it's a mirror on um, being held up to us. You know, that's why sometimes Leonard even talks about like his life is his Sundance, right? Because he's been suffering for a long, long time. But even his suffering brings light to the to, to these issues. Um, but deep down inside there is a human being. You know, who was standing up for his people, who at one point, every facet in this system that we have decided to come after him and decided to come after this movement. And on this show, we talk a lot in the land back movement that the land back movement isn't just about the return of indigenous lands back into indigenous hands. It is about dismantling some of the very systems that have been put in place to not only steal our lands in the first place or steal our freedom in in the first place, um, but exist to maintain the continued theft of our lands, our culture, our rights, and our people. And so when we think about um, Leonard's incarceration, it is a massive symbol of the injustice that has happened to all Indigenous people, but he's still a person in there. We're going to dig a little bit more into the details of his case. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, Bruce, if you can shed a little bit of light on like the a short arc of uh, what happened, you know, what kind of constitutional uh, violations and uh, misconduct of, bro- of prosecutors, what are the things that happened that led to Leonard being found guilty and put in prison? It's a long question with a long answer, but I'll try and be a brief. And let's set the context. At the same time, the domestic security section was declaring war on AIM in the early to mid-70s. Some 27 multinational corporations were claiming this entire region for mineral resources, like we're under that assault again today. Mm. And AIM was considered to be one of the big threats to that. And in fact, shortly, not too long before the firefight, the FBI listed the goals of AIM. And one of the things they noted as a new goal was that AIM was going to be against mining, which destroyed the earth. And I mention that because this was a domestic security operation. After the firefight that same day, the criminal investigation was turned away from the normal and senior FBI official who would do, be in charge of the investigation and turned over to the head of the domestic security section of the FBI. The much larger resources of the criminal division became the resources of the domestic security and the intelligence division. That's what Leonard case, Leonard's case and the other men's cases then focused in. But, um, within a few weeks after the firefight, simply from evidence of finding Leonard's fingerprints on some boxes of ammunition in a camp about a third of a mile from where the agents were killed, they decided he had killed the agents. And they started focusing all their attention on that. They thought it was going to be an easy kind of a situation. Leonard was arrested in Canada and fought extradition by the time that trials started coming around. And Daryl Butler and Bob Robidoux, who were charged with him, went to trial and claimed self-defense. The government's theory that these two men and Leonard Peltier aided and abetted each other in the deaths of the agents because although the government wanted to believe that Leonard shot the agents, they couldn't prove it. After Butler and Robidoux were acquitted on self-defense grounds, they returned fire after being fired upon by Kohler and Williams and other agents that particular day, as backed up by Norman Brown's testimony, one of the teenagers who was there that day, that he saw these men firing in the direction of the agents after they fired in, those agents fired in the direction of the two men. After the acquittal, 
There was a meeting in Washington, D.C. that was held at FBI headquarters, and the government decided to dismiss the charges against Jimmy Eagle, the fourth person, and really the person that agents on the ground thought they were, Colin Williams, and Colin Williams thought they were chasing when this firefight started, clearly. And they buried a lot of evidence to the contra- to, that supported that. So after that meeting, where the full evidence was going to be, a full weight of the prosecution was going to be turned against Leonard Peltier, a pickup that was what the agents were firing in suddenly became a van that Leonard had some remote connection to. Ballistics evidence from a weapon that there was no match to that they tried to attribute to Leonard's possession suddenly had a match. And we later learned that evidence was fabricated. And in fact, that's you know, post conviction. That's post conviction. That. I mean, basically, right. you know, what Leonard's case, you know, Leonard tried everything he could. He is, they tried him as a shooter. They, 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 Changed because of the way everything from. happened, they convicted him as a shooter. When that evidence was contradicted by this ballistics evidence that it couldn't have been that weapon, then they, they basically argued, well, he's really was an aider and a better. Well, he never had a chance to have an aiding and abetting defense, which his co-defendants were acquitted on for self-defense grounds, which only got stronger with the when we got more and more documents that this was a case of fraud by by the government. I mean, he was even illegally extra extradited yes. from, from Canada. Yes. Right. That was part of it because what the government did was they would get vulnerable people. Like they got one person who they pressured who who had never even been to the community before. Never even knew who Leonard Peltier was. And they threatened her, and then they told her they were her protection because they said AIM was going to get her because they, they put out that AIM, she was working with the or FBI. Yeah. The Myrtle, Myrtle Poor Bear. Yeah, Myrtle. And, and, and so she signed an affidavit, three affidavits. The uh, first one said that she was there right before the firefight and left, and Leonard later confessed to her. And then she signed later affidavits which said that she was present, saw Leonard shoot and kill the agents. And it was a complete fabrication. She was He was extradited on those affidavits. Uh, a judge later commented upon them, an appellate judge, who said to the prosecutors, don't you see if the government's willing to fabricate this kind of evidence to extradite a person, then what are they willing to do to try and convict a person? To which the lawyer said, and Troy Leonard said, exactly. But then he was, every time he tried to prove it, they would shoot him down. Every step of the way, you know. Um, Holly, can you talk a a little bit about um, some of the people who were actually involved in Leonard's prosecution have actually come out and some people, even in the FBI, have come out um, in support of Leonard's uh, freedom now. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. The In, in uh, 1992, Gerald Haney, who handled uh, his appeal in the circuit, uh, he stepped and then he came forward in 1992. He came forward in 2000 um, and wrote a letter uh, first to the president and then to the chairs of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Um and back then, I believe it was uh, Daniel Inouye um, in 2000 that he wrote a letter to. And I draw that parallel because the current chair in, in uh, all these years later, uh, Senator Schatz has also written a letter in support of clemency. So um, he was the first one to step forward. And then we we had um, we had. Uh, Reynolds, who was the prosecuting, the U.S. attorney who handled the prosecution and appeal, his office handled, um, and he stepped forward and wrote a, a letter first to President um, uh, Obama, was I think was his first letter, and then he wrote a letter last year to President Biden in support of clemency and saying that um, the racism that was present in Pine Ridge and the atmosphere that was created um by the FBI in Pine Ridge, as as Bruce has described, um, is no longer should no longer take place in our society, and that essentially enough is enough. Leonard has paid his due. Um, after that, Colleen Raleigh, who was the special agent in charge um, for the FBI office, the Minneapolis field office, who has the Dakotas under their jurisdiction, just last December, she wrote a letter to President Biden. This was a remarkable breakthrough. Um, in this and in what it, and really and what it is the FBI, right? She is the FBI and she in charge of the Minneapolis office at the time and was in charge of many of the agents who worked on this case. So this is uh, someone with authority and prox- in proximity to the case. 
And um, and what I what I really call all of this adds up to a tipping point, right? I, I think for many of us, the advocacy and the fight for Leonard has been a part of of Indian country in our lives and the, in our stories. Um, but this is a tipping point. Everyone has stepped forward. And Colleen Raleigh not only recognized the racism and the the atmosphere that was created by by the FBI on, on, um, on Pine Ridge back then, but she also, for the first time, called out the FBI family vendetta. And that FBI family vendetta, the, friend, the friends and family of the FBI, um, an organization of retired FBI agents and um, and their families um, and their friends, the um, have worked very hard every single time Leonard has had an opportunity to be freed, whether it was his first parole hearing in 2009, which was the first one after the ballistic evidence had been uncovered, and the parole agent recommended that he be paroled in light of the new evidence. Well, they fired that parole agent. And got a new one who then recommended that no, he not be paroled. There are there is 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 misconduct and shenanigans and injustice. Uh, I feel like that word can't be overused in this instance. That is shocking, and that um, you know when we when we when we the other narrative continues, and I, I still hear it in Indian country sometimes, and I want to say you're only supporting a narrative that the FBI has long supported in order to keep a man who um, they admit the prosecution admitted they couldn't prove committed a crime on the jumping bull ranch that day. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, they use every single resource available to them to create false narratives to engage in prosecutorial misconduct, to uh, fabricate evidence, to fabricate witnesses, uh, not to mention if the people were acquitted. I mean, who did he aid and abet in the first place uh, if they were acquitted for uh, self-defense? Uh, and so um, yet here we are in the year 2023. Uh, Joe Biden is president uh, of the United States. He has savvied himself as a champion for BIPOC communities. He has, uh, him and Merrick Garland have championed themselves uh, as avid advocates for um, Native American civil rights. Uh, They've said it's a priority. They told that to the uh, tribal leaders summit, uh, to the tribal leaders at the White House summit just last year. Um, yet here we are. Leonard Peltier has been in jail for 48 years, going on 49, mm-hmm. the longest living indigenous political prisoner in the history of the United States at this point. And um, let's talk a little bit about the latest efforts, the latest efforts to um, to fight for Leonard Peltier's freedom. The it's interesting to to hear you say political prisoner, because when I came to this work, I thought, you know, come on, is that too strong a phrase? Right. But everything I've learned about this, everything we just talked about, it is it is the the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention um, last year said it is clear that he is being detained because he is a Native American. And to hear that that phrase, just the recognition that Leonard Peltier is still in prison because he is a Native American. It was is 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 shocking to me all all the time. You know, it's the attitude of the FBI that any Indian will do, right? Somebody's going to go down for this. And Leonard um, is now he will be seventy nine years old on September twelfth. Um, in March, he will will that will mark his forty ninth year in um, in prison and still in a maximum security prison at this age. You know, I went to visit him last month. I mean, and stop, stop and think that for, for that yeah. for a minute. All of you that are listening, that are watching, 79 years old out in your communities, those are elders. Mm-hmm. Those are elders you're bringing groceries to. Those are elders that are barely getting around, yet Leonard's in a maximum security prison, prison in, you know, at Coleman in Florida. I mean, think about that for a minute. Um just the injustice of that, that our own people, our own elders would still be in there after given all this history 
of injustice. I just wanted to pause for a minute to think about that. And so, it, and I digressed as well, but it brings us to the work that we're doing today and um, the sort of voices that are coming together. There are, we have, we have support from tribal leadership around the country in that are weighing in with President Biden in support of clemency or his petition for compassionate release. And we have members of Congress who have written. We have um, U.S. senators who have written and are preparing to write again. The the um, the case of Leonard Peltier has reached a point where the broad and wide recognition, um, not just in, in 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 fringe groups or or voices um, that have not you know, maybe been recognized as leadership voices or have influenced over these years is really um, the case has come to the attention of so many across mm -hmm. Indian country. We are working to influence an administration that rightfully so claims to be the best one for Indian country that has ever been in place. And that is true. We have Deb Holland as the Secretary of Interior. The symbolism of that cannot be overstated. We have more Senate-confirmed Native Americans in positions throughout the government. That that on the daily for Indian country is so critical. Consul the, the consultation, all of these things, these are substantive accomplishments of an administration that we can point to. But if Leonard Peltier if this administration passes again, it will have a stain on it because of the missed opportunity to free a man who has is now widely recognized by tribal leadership, elected leadership throughout this country, that enough is enough. I think time is of the essence. You know, as he gets older and older and talking with them, he, he wants to come home mm -hmm. back to his family and to his people. Um, he's been isolated from the movement that he helped contribute to and be a part of. He hasn't been there to be able to see some of his own family grow old. Um, and yet the stances that he took, along with many others in the American Indian movement, have built the very foundation and contributed to the foundation which we stand on today. Mm -hmm. That That there is... Things like the Native American Freedom of Religion Act, the Indian Education and Self-Determination Act, many of these things that Indian country is a beneficiary of that have come from a place of resistance mm -hmm. and m forcing to make sure that there is um, indigenous people at the table. And so uh, in, these, in this effort to free Leonard Paltier, we have to continue to... Uh, think about the context of it. I mean, it, it occurred to me just the other day when somebody said, you know, Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela was incarcerated, I think for 27 years. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Nelson Mandela was incarcerated for 27 years. Leonard Paltier has been incarcerated for 48 years, going on 49. And yet prosecutors... FBI, people involved in uh, in his incarceration have come forward because they have had conscious, they have, uh, they have a better understanding than they did at the time. Um, they're probably not threatening, uh, they're probably not worried about their jobs, uh, you know, now like they were back then, are being pressured by the powers that be within the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but also it's a different political climate than it was then too. Um, and so we encourage everybody out there um, that this story, that this story of Leonard Paltier's uh, incarceration and justice, that this story is not over. That our goal as a movement is to unite our people together, to put pressure on this administration to fight for Leonard Paltier's freedom, to bring him home back to his people uh, at Turtle Mountain, but also bring him back home to the movement. Because I would say that this, the th and I told this him on the phone uh, recently when I had opportunity to, to talk to Leonard, was that the one thing that you would be a proud of, Leonard, is that there is a vibrant indigenous people's movement today. Mm -hmm. That there, uh, and that land, and the, the land back movement has been part of the fire in that. All throughout Indi Indian country and indigenous communities, people are rising up. People are coming and forcing their place at the, ta at, the at the table 
in many of the same ways that the American Indian movement did. did. We're doing it with our language. We're doing it with our culture. We're doing it through organizing direct action. But we also stand on the shoulders of people like Leonard and those of his generation that have created the very foundation that we stand on. And so we owe it to that generation to fight for Leonard's freedom and to stand in solidarity in this multi-generational effort to free Leonard Peltier. And it's an opportunity for the president of the United States and for the Department of Justice, for this entire administration that says and talks about that its priority is indigenous people, is Indian country, indigenous people's civil rights. It's an opportunity to put your words into action, to free Leonard Peltier, to have him return home from our people. So I just want to thank both of you uh, for coming on to this show, for sharing, for your hard work and uh, both working for Leonard when uh, you were his lawyer and working for Leonard right now um, as your as the advocacy. Um, and thank you both for, for being on Land Back for the People. Thank you. Miigwech, Nick. Miigwech, Bruce. Thank you. I think it was, I think, I thought it was good.